Um, I'm very happy that you're all here for the 10th episode of Stefan Frank's photo book show. Um, for those of you who are new to the photo book show in this series, Stefan, who um, teaches very popular classes for us here at Strudel Media Live, he looks at recent and not so recent photo books. Today's subject is a thousand words on the role of text in photo books. I'm Anya of Strudel Media Live, and we offer online photography classes. And yeah, I want to thank you again for joining today. If you want to ask questions, you can simply just unmute and ask Stefan, um, or you can put them into the chat. That's another option. The talk will be about an hour long. And um, yeah, now I want to thank uh, all of you for being here and for Stefan for yet another episode of his photo book show. Stefan, you may take over from here. Thank you so much, Anja, for having me. And thank you all for, for being here today. Um, really excited to see so many familiar and so many new faces. Um, yeah, so for those of you who are new to this uh, to this photo book show format, um, the way I'm doing it is I'm always showing uh, some introductory slides, which we'll um, start with right now. So just to give you some, some context, uh, for the things we will be looking at. And after that, um, I will be um, I will be looking we'll be looking at the photo books. Um, so without further ado, um, get this a little bit out of the way here. So without further ado, let me start with this. Um, This is season two. We actually had a, a season one, uh, and as Anya said, we already have this um, these ten shows on the on the YouTube channel. Um, for this season, I want to do things a little bit differently, um, so we'll not be looking at uh, actual the whole photo book to make you say, "Okay, these are great photo books. Uh, please buy them." Uh, we'll be looking at uh, photo books in a different way, in in the way that. Uh, if you want to do a photo book, uh, how would you do that? Uh, so we we'll start today with, with the idea of um, uh, there is text in photo books. And so let me start with a simple disclaimer here. Uh, we'll be looking at a lot of words, which is quite a difference to, to the other photo book shows, because in the other photo book shows, we usually look at a lot of pictures. So today we'll be looking at a lot of words. Um, when I prepared for this, um, I stumbled upon this is the 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 proverb that this uh, the title of today's photo book show comes from. Um, a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, you already uh, you all know this proverb, and I looked up where this comes actually comes from. Um, when you look at it, where it comes from, um, you hit upon these uh, myths where it comes from. Uh, disclaimer here, it is not Chinese or Japanese proverb, mm -hmm. uh, as these people from uh, Printers Inc., which was an advertising agency in the in the 30s, uh, claim. Uh, this actually means some kind of gibberish. So if you want to get a Chinese or Japanese tattoo, uh, you probably should check what it actually means. So this <laughs> does not mean a picture as worth a thousand words. Um, the origin comes from, from these kinds of things. It comes from advertising. Uh, so this is the first incident where you see that every picture tells a story. Um, this is uh, an advertisement for don'ts, uh, backache, kidney pills from uh, around the start, the, the turn of the last century. Um, this is the first known um, quote where it uh, where the where you see this uh, use of pictures words a thousand words. Um, I think it's not a coincidence that is this is from Arthur Brisbane from the Syracuse Advertising Men's Club uh, from March 1911. It's not an accident that it's a uh, it's an advertising uh, guy that came up with this idea. Um, the reason why I said it's not a coincidence. Um, 
in advertising, uh, pictures are used much, much more than uh, words are used. So we, this is very simple right now. So um, images can convey messages must, much faster than text and the human brain processes images 60,000 times faster than text. Um, if you look at um, these brain processing um, things, uh, developments there, there's a lot of stuff that is driven by uh, advertising here. So advertisers are looking into how you can effectively convey your brand's story here. So they are using, um, if you look into the advertising, uh, they are using um, pictures much more prominent than they use text. Uh, why are they doing this? They're basically doing this because pictures work a little bit differently than words do. Um, they are used for evoking emotions and, and setting expectations. So this is these are quotes from Corporate Vision News, one of these advertising uh, magazines. Um, they are using pictures because it creates strong emotions and feeling. For example, Coca-Cola use, uses red to evoke feelings of fun, energy, and positivity. Uh, this is something that you cannot usually expect from, from text. It is not doesn't work in such a direct way. So there's, you immediately see there's a difference between how text work and how images work. Um, from this, you can derive pictures are very effective tools of advertising and of propaganda. And if you look into the history of, of the 20th century, how important pictures were and how they functioned in the, um, in the 20th century and even more so in our century, which is swamped with uh, with pictures, you can see where this where this originates. Um, of course, we get the ever grumpy Susan Sontag, who had their own uh, has her own way of of phrasing that. Uh, she said, "A capitalist society requires a culture based on image. It needs to furnish vast amounts of entertainment in order to stimulate buying and." anesthetize the injuries of class, race, and sex, it, and it needs to gather unlimited amounts of information. The better to exploit natural resources, increase productivity, keep order, make war, give jobs to bureaucrats. The camera's twin capacities to subjectivize reality and to objectify it ideally serves these needs and strengthens them. Cameras define reality in the two ways essential to the working of an advanced industrial society as a spectacle for masses and as an object of surveillance. So we always, we always come back to Susan Sontag and her grumpy way of uh, phrasing her, um, her disgust with, uh, with how images work in our societies. Um, we have a much, much longer history of how we consume um, pictures than we have how we consume words. Uh, this goes back to uh, 17,000 years ago. Uh, these are cave paintings from Lascaux. So we are basically a visual, we have visual origins much more than we have literal origins. In contrast to this, uh, the printing press was invented in the 15th century, which gave rise to this, to the distribution of words in a, in a very different way. So books were in the beginning associated with words. So this is where, where it came from. And it was also uh, used to drive um, more crit criticism against uh, the, ruling, um, the ruling classes and the ruling, um, the ruling positions in society. This is of course a, a picture of the Luther Bible, which originates in 1520, which was a, uh, a protest uh, against the uh, ruling clergy class. So this is where the book was originally positioned. So usually enlightenment and the age of enlightenment, which started just after that uh, is associated with words. It's not necessarily associated with pictures so much. So let me put this very, very uh, blunt here. Uh, words are more critical and pictures are more aff affirmative in this way. 
So this, of course, is a crude oversimplification because you can lie with words just as good as you can lie with pictures. Uh, but you get the idea that it is complicated, uh, that we are entering a complicated world when we put pictures and words together. Uh, of course, today we are very far removed from this original Gutenberg printing presses, which were limited to uh, to words only. Now we print digital. This is the Happy Indigo digital printing press. It uh, can do magic, uh, a lot of magic in print, and can, can print pretty much on everything. So the relationship between text and images is, is much more prominent today so we combine this in a very more uh, in a much more fluent way than we did uh, in the early days of printing so let's quickly talk about this relationship between um between the uh the image and the text uh one of these relationships is what uh, people call mickey mousing so mickey mousing uh comes from this original Steamboat Willie, which was the first animated movie by uh, Walt Disney uh, with a soundtrack by, by Max Steiner. And the idea of Mickey Mousing is that the music uh, set to the, uh, to the moving pictures is used to reinforce an action by mimicking its rhythm exactly. So when you see uh, Mickey Mouse tiptoeing uh, around, uh, around the boat, uh, you can hear the, this tiptoeing uh, again repeated in the uh, in the sound that accompanies it. And in the relationship between text and images, Mickey Mousing is often used to describe uh, to to say that we're describing in words what you already see in the picture. So kind of doubling, which is something like this uh, when you combine picture and words like this. This is a picture of an apple, which is sort of what you already see in, in the picture. But of course, this is a most simplistic relationship between text and image. It gets more complicated uh, immediately when you put it like this. So today we will be looking especially at this gap uh, between the photos and the text. So when you combine photos and text in a uh, in, an, in a photo book, you always get a gap. Uh, you always get the one thing that the photo says and the other thing that the text says. And there is always um, a gap between these two. So we are very interested in this gap, how this works, how it moves through, through different uh, pictures here. We'll also be looking at the function of text in the photo book. So what does it do? Um, one of the function of um, Photo books uh, of text in photo books is working against our tendency to, to dismiss images. We are so used today to dismiss images. When you go around the street and you look at a lot of advertising, this is just a defense mechanism at the pictures that the world throws at you. So we are very used to not look at images. So in a photo book, this can often happen that you um, open up a photo box, you flip through the, uh, the pages and you say, I, I'm not actually interested in that. So we are dismissing a lot of images. And there's, sometimes it can happen that we're actually missing something. So we're looking at a picture and we don't understand what we're actually seeing. So one um, function of text and photo book can be seen. Okay, you are missing something. Uh, and here is what it is. Um, so text in a photo can help you understand what you're actually looking at. And that makes often makes um, photo books more interesting than just the, uh, the pictures alone. Um, other functions can be framing. So when you take a photograph, you lose a lot of context. Text can be used to give you back this context. Sometimes it is not that direct. Sometimes uh, text works more elliptical. So it's more circulating around a common center. Uh, it can also be used to expand uh, what you see in the pictures. So these are the functions. We will also be looking at, at more structural aspects today. So where is it 
uh, where is the text placed? Is it in an introduction? Is it in an epilogue? Is it scattered? Um, we look at the relationship, different relationships between the uh, words and pictures. Um, and this is should already be enough to show you the first um, photo book here. Let me start with a classic here. Um, this is Time in New England by uh, by Paul Strand. Um, I put this in here for uh, for somebody who had taken a lot of uh, had one taken one of my classes here, and who probably knows what I'm talking about when I'm talking about Paul Strand here because we both love Paul Strand. Um, this is a very classical photo book. It is exactly what it says on the title. It is a description of a time in New England, and. Paul Strand, you probably know his pictures of uh, the blind woman, which is in, probably in the top 10 of the best uh, photos ever. He's a very, um, um, he's, he's an excellent photographer. And what he did, he spent some time in New England and he made photos there. And what his co-author uh, Nancy Newhall did, she collected a lot of, um, she collected a lot of uh, texts that circulate around uh, New England. So it has a lot of uh, chapters that say something like uh, birds and beasts. And here you already see what is meant with Mickey Mousing. So the title says it's birds and beasts. So Paul Strand puts in a picture of a bird. And the relationship here is is pretty pretty direct in a lot of cases here, like this birds and beasts. Um, here is a chapter about heaven and hell, about churches in New England, and so of course he puts in a picture of a church. Here. So, picture and text have a very direct relationship. You have a lot of text in here, so it's really um, it it tells you a certain way to consume this kind of book. So it tells you, okay, here, start with a picture. So this picture gets in the mood and then you have to, to read the text and text is sometimes it's really good. So if you really want to get into the mood and know more about how New England works and how um, whale fishing works and how the um, New England is, um, what things you can find in New England, this is, the text that you actually want to read here. So you see, you always have a very equal distribution of pictures and text. And you have a lot of this, okay, the pictures, like this picture of the sea, it is a very direct uh, way of uh, photographing and putting uh, text and pictures together. So Paul Strand, can photograph pretty much everything. So uh, he also has this wonderful portraits in here. And it really is um, a complete journey through New England. So you see um, the sea, the churches, uh, the people that inhabit the, the land, um, the trees, uh, the birds. So it's really a complete journey here. And in this distribution, you have uh, a very text heavy. Um, this makes a book very text heavy here. So this is one way to put um, text and images together in a very even distribution. Let me give you the second example here. So I'm always um, I'm always coming back to this book because it's um, it's one of the most important books of the 20th century, uh, and it is one of the most important books for me. This, of course, is Waffenruhe, uh, and it is as you see here on the title, it is by Michael Schmidt and Einar Schleif. So Michael Schmidt was a photographer, and Einar Schleif contributed the the text in here. And um, let me start by showing you the position of the text. 
And the position of the text, as you can see here, it is in the middle of the book. And in the middle of the text, there is a picture. It is this picture here. And then the, oops, it is this, it is this picture here. And the, so this is the middle of the book. And in the middle of the text, you get a picture that uh, cuts the text into half. So you really get a, um, a series of photos that is interrupted by this um, not very easy to read text because it's really, uh, it's huge. It's a text block. Um, and even the text block and the text block itself then gets interrupted by a picture. So this is the structure of the text and how it's distributed. And before, you just get pictures. And afterwards, it's the same. So after the text is finished, you again continue with pictures. So the text in here is actually the reason um, why the book has two authors. It has uh, the photographer as an author and the writer as an author, and which is a weird, weird thing to have uh, in a photo book. And when you see uh, text about Michael Schmidt's Waffenruhe, uh, we usually neglect uh, the contribution of Einer Schlief. And um, the book is about, uh, the pictures are from, from Berlin in the 80s. So it was the time before uh, the fall of the wall, before the wall came down. Um, and the text is about a man who sits alone in his apartment uh, after his wife and his kids have have, uh, have left him. Uh, and the only other inhabitant is uh, the rabbit uh, that the kid has uh, left behind. So you have here two bodies of work that are combined um, around, um, that are combined with each other and they do not even cover the same topic. So. Uh, the text never mentions Berlin, it never mentions the wall, it never mentions the uh, situation of the Cold War. Instead of, uh, it goes on rambling endlessly about uh, the loneliness of this uh, of this man who is sitting alone in his uh, in his apartment and is uh, his chain smoking. So, when I meant uh, when I mentioned elliptical, this gives you a very elliptical structure for both the pictures and the story. And the center of this is not so much the a common historical situation, but it is a common feeling, which is which I find fascinating because the, the feeling that the, the pictures bring across, this feeling of loneliness, of isolation, of a certain suspended state, uh, the feeling of um, the shadow of history that is still looming up, uh, about uh, over the city. Uh, these uh, aspects of, of suicide that you see here. Um, this is almost identical to the feeling that you get when you read the text. So this enriches the experience of the photo book here. And it's interesting to do it in a in a very indirect way, which is when you compare it to this, uh, which is which makes it a very different way of structuring a photo book because this is just it, it's time in New England. These are pictures from New England and these are stories from New England. So it's a very direct way of combining this together, and this is a very different way because they only have the common a common feeling in their center uh, that they share.
Washington. Great book. Um, let me come to the to the next one. So, this is uh, Florian Glaubitz. Um, let me start by saying that I love the pictures in this book. So it's really uh, an interesting book. Uh, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting pictures. In it. And let me show you some of the pictures in here. To give you an idea why I love why I love this book. Yeah, what was it? So let me pause it for a minute. Does anybody understand what this book is about? This is the way uh, people flip through images uh, through through image books in uh, when they see it in the shop, and uh, this creates um, a weird combination of accidentally matched uh, photos. Um, the book also contains a lot of essays here. Uh, and by piecing the information of this essay that are just scattered uh, throughout the book, uh, like this one about vessels and contents, when you read through the essays, you uh, slowly, very slowly, uh, figure out what this is about. Uh, Florian Glaubitz has spent um, time at the um, Kunsthochschule Art School of uh, Leipzig, and they have um, they have a department for uh, ceramics. And this department of ceramics is um, historically tied to the Bauhaus, to the German Bauhaus. And he spent uh, some time at this um, at this Kunsthochschule, at this art school. And he spent, uh, he watched, he was photographing in the um, uh, in the studios and the workshops uh, where they produce these kinds of uh, ceramics. Uh, he spent time with, uh, with the students there. And basically the pictures are about this. They are about uh, the uh, how how you learn to produce uh, ceramics and how you tie uh, how this school this art school ties back to uh, the long history of ceramics uh, that dates back to the uh, the Bauhaus in the in the twenties and this is super interesting when you know when you know this kind of background story you suddenly see ah okay it's a lot of about this about the materialism, about the material uh, that are that is used in in ceramics, and it is about uh, the process of how you conceive um, how you conceive ceramics, how you relate them to uh, their use function, how people use ceramics, and how this relates back to uh, to the body. And suddenly, 
a lot of these pictures uh, make sense. And then you see these, um, these um, essays in here and the essays um, tell you about this, uh, about this background story, about the background story of uh, the Bauhaus, about the feminist movement inside uh, the Bauhaus, how women came into, uh, into art school, which was pretty new in the 20s, and which is, of course, uh, very different uh, from today, how um, women perceive these studies today. So this whole story you have to piece together. And my complaint about this is that these essays here uh, try too hard. They try too hard to uh, put it into some kind of art, art context here. Um, from this, what I learned is if you put text in a photo book, it has to be really good. So again, if you compare it to this and to Aina Schleif, uh, the, dif the difference here is the text is really good. It's really blows you off your feet. And here, this is text that is really dry and artsy and is trying very hard to put this into, to frame this into some kind of art context. And I would really have loved this kind of background story in just a few words to say, okay, I've been there, I've been with the people and this is how they work. So and uh, Stefan, I have maybe a kind of simple-minded question. Sure. And it doesn't have to do so much with the text, but I notice that several of the images, the orientation is uh, turned to the side. Mm -hmm. um, and like, for example, with the chairs, I think you were showing la the end here. Yeah, yeah. later. And I'm just wondering what you think about that. Is, is he intending uh, that you turn the book? Is he intending these images to be in that orientation? I think there were some others, like there are two images on the left side and one image on the right, something like that. I forget exactly where it was. Like this it, one here, yeah. I'm just kind of curious what you think about this. Or... I, I, I sometimes have a, a similar issue with some of the pictures in there and with some of the design choices in there, because I think, they have they, they have a similar issue of um, trying hard trying too hard to be art, mm -hmm. and I, I get this I get the picture uh, I, I get the idea behind this because I think this this kind of orientation shifts uh, it's just connected to the way you you uh, you use your ceramics because you you finish them when you paint them you uh, put them around those they have. Uh, they take on different shapes here. And this is, I think, what he is trying to convey with this very, let me look for the chair image that you mentioned. Uh, I think this is what he's trying to convey, mm. that it's moving around and then you take, uh, you take something like this and if you shift it slightly, it takes on another shape. So this is, it's intentional, I assume it's intentional. It's not just because the uh, the format is changing, uh, but to me, it's it's a little bit trying too hard. Hmm. This uh, is spread is a nice example of what I was. Mm -hmm. It seems odd, but it seems odd because you cannot see. Okay, this is this takes on another shape here. It takes hmm. on this shape, and you cannot see. Okay, this is actually house, and now you can see it. Yeah, I have this. I have this feeling with the whole book. I have this feeling with the text too that it's trying to. Okay, look at me. I'm artsy. I'm very artsy, which is a shame because uh, there are some some very. Let me sh sh try to show you some of the very nice portraits in here. Oh, this of Patrick Swayze in So it has some humor to them. Yeah, the, here I think it works. Here I think it works pretty well. I get some get some light here. Wow. Um 
It has pictures like this, which I think, which are really great because they are using all kinds of uh, spatulas to uh, to do these ceramics. And this is a directly connects it back to the body from which these forms originate. So this is a really great spread here. Um, so it has a lot of these, like this one, this one I love because it's really nice, funny portrait, which appears within these structure, which says, okay, it's actually fun to, to study this at this place. And this is where the whole uh, picture book flipped for me, because here, when you, when you read these essays, it's really dry and artsy, and you have all this connection there. I get that, and you have references on and on. But here, uh, it starts to get to, to, to spring to life for me. But again, if you don't have the if you don't have the asses here, you don't get what it's about. Okay, let's come to the last two. We're good in we're good in time. Uh, because the last two I, I really love dearly. So this is um Julia Palato. I hope I spell her name or say her name uh, correctly. This is, I don't know if you can see it right now. This is Julia Palato's uh, Dia Chronicles. And just to make sure to not read it correctly. So what I found, um, I did not find anything on the title here. So the title uh, is Dia Chronic is concerned with the way in which something, especially language, uh, has developed over time. And let's do the same thing uh, that we did with uh, with the Florian Glaubitz book. Let me just flip through this and let's look at some pictures here. So, and now let's try the very same thing here that we did with, with Florian Glaubitz. What is it about? Um, and the structure here is, is very different from the Florian Glaubitz book. It has, uh, it ha has only one essay here. And the essay is by, um, uh, by the British critic and, and curator and writer, uh, David Campany. And he begins uh, with a story, with a fictional story. And he says, uh, he starts with a fictional story that let's assume um, a museum uh, acquired this body of work, this these pictures, and they carefully inserted it into their database, they have filed it away and have uh, written text on what it is, what you see on the pictures. And suddenly, um, by an accident that erased all the databases and um, removed all the, the captions and the title from this work. Um, suddenly, all this information about what this book is about gets lost. 
And when it is um, when when the people look at these images, uh, everybody tries to make up their own mind what we are actually looking at, what it is about, and how to make sense of these kinds of of pictures here. And he then uh, the story in this in this essay that comes here at the beginning, it goes on from here because this is a book um, about how museums. Um, store information, how they curate, how these um, artifacts and the way we tell stories about these artifacts, how this changes over time. So this is actually um, a book about how these, um, how we construct um, memories of our societies or of the societies we visit and we collect in these museums, how they change, how we construct them and how they change over time. And when you have this kind of information, suddenly all these pictures are starting to make sense because you see, okay, we're uh, constantly in a museum. Uh, we're constantly uh, looking at pictures that talk about um, this loss of information about this uh, how we look at some kind of emptiness and how this emptiness um, forms some kind of projection space onto which we can uh, onto which we project our own interpretation of these artworks like when you look at a picture like this which is about restoring images um, we're not only restoring the images as they were we're forming new narratives around them when we put stuff together like this, we are always telling new stories. And the whole book is about this, um, about the emptiness in, in the middle, which is the, the artifact. And the artifact is always um, a projection space here. And here sh suddenly this picture of an empty case, uh, which is a reception, uh, like a receptacle for these kinds of artifacts. Suddenly everything makes sense. And what I love about the structure is that it is a very uh, straightforward intro. It stands at the beginning. Uh, it stands at the beginning of the book, so it tells you. Uh, it also tells you uh, a fictional story that mimics the structures of the photos, and the structure of the photos very closely mimic. Um, the, the sequencing of the image very closely mimic the sequence of the essay uh, it, with this loss of information that is at the beginning of the book. Because you see here in these pictures, in this introductory sequence here in the beginning, you have absolutely no idea what is going on, what is happening. So, and slowly everything gets a little bit clearer, it gets a little bit more into focus. And suddenly we see the first thing um, where we see um, somebody is restoring something or somebody is shaping something. So all this is about shaping. So this is very a very close mimic to this first introductory um, sentence here in the, in the essay here. And both things help here, both uh, the, the, the fact that David Campany uh, is a very good writer and writes his essay in a very um, entertaining and good and informative way, and that Julia Palato is a very good photographer. So the, the photos themselves have some interest here. And putting these things together uh, then really makes a lot of sense and makes a really wonderful book here. Dear Chronicles, Julia Palato, highly recommend. So let, let's end, let's end on this one. Um, because this is another um, another way, another relationship of text and, and text and image. And uh, let's do the same thing that David Campany, who is um, just by chance also the author of this book, uh, let's do the very same thing that he uh, proposed here. Uh, let's throw away stuff. 
So here in the in the middle of this, you see there is an inlet in the book. And the inside of this book, this contains a text to the images. So let's throw that away. So now you have a book that doesn't contain any words at all. It has no captions. It has no text at all. So when you throw this thing here away, you actually repeat the story uh, that David Campany just told in the in the other book. So if you remove the uh, the text on the jacket, you uh, are left with absolutely no information what you uh, what you actually see here. So and then this leaves us with weird pictures, weird pictures of dust of a dust storm, people moving through dust, and in the you see things like um, this here, this double spread of a person lying on the ground and you cannot, you have no way of knowing if he's sleeping or if he's dead, uh, but you also see a grave on the other side. You get pictures of flags, which you don't know where they come from or who made them. You have pictures of war. You have pictures of uh, dripping paint and of Jackson Pollock. Sometimes you know what you're seeing and sometimes you have no idea. You have no idea where this, where this connection, uh, what is the connection between these two images here. Suddenly we go into forensics, into uh, how fingerprints are developed. We have pictures like this. When you happen to know him, you know, uh, you see pictures of John Bivola and his uh, houses that he repainted. And you have pictures Can like this. Something? I'm Victoria here. Yeah, sure, sure. And so uh, how do you imagine, you know, I see the pictures and I think all that you're presenting is very interesting. Um, it, what should catch, if you don't understand at all, the pictures are very disparate, uh, you know, uh, what will keep you, what will want you to find out what is the key, the key, or do you have to imagine a key uh, to opening and to con uh, connecting uh, the images? Well, this is the beauty of this book. The beauty of this book is that uh, there is a key inside. And the key is how it is fabricated is in a way. Uh, when you open the book, uh, the key falls out. And the key here is this one, um, it is a beginning story. And the, the story behind this book is um, this photo here is a photo by Man Ray uh, who visited Marcel Duchamp and Marcel Duchamp had this um, early draft of his uh, large glass uh, stored in his attic and he has forgotten it there. And this is um, an artwork, maybe you have seen it. Uh, I think there is a copy in, in MoMA. So it's just what it says. It's a, a large glass construction that has these uh, inlet paintings in there. And he tells a story that, and, and uh, David Campany tells a story that um, Man Ray walked into this, this attic. Uh, he set up his equipment, his camera, and, um, he opened the shutter and then he forgot about it and both went uh, to dinner and they came back uh, three years, uh, three um, hours after. And then he realized, okay, I've already opened the shutter. So he closed it down and he produced um, this three hour long uh, photograph. 
of this painting, uh, of this uh, artwork by Marcel Duchamp. And what Campany does here, he derives from this one photograph, it's just only one photograph, this is a book that originates from one photograph, from this photograph, he connects more and more pictures to it. Um, because this photo, if you look at it, it contains all these elements that you see in, in the book, it contains dust. So then from here, he goes on to saying, uh, okay, there was uh, the Dust Bowl in the 20s and uh, in the US. So then he talked, then he shows, um, where is it? Then he shows pictures of the Dust Bowl. How things are vanishing in the dust. Um, he also, he has these pictures of how people are moving through the dust. And then he has this picture of um, a woman painting on, um, on this dust that has uh, flown into her house. So the dust bowl is connected to this because it's dust. Uh, he also talks about um, aerial pictures of the war because this actually looks like, um, when you do not know the story, it looks like uh, a picture of a landscape from above. So here he starts talking about, hey, this is how aerial photography was. And these are pictures of um, war scenes filmed from above, which are roughly uh, from, the same, from the same time. Yeah, so should you read? So should you read the text first, or look at the pictures, or whatever you feel like? It's intriguing. I like it very much what you're I, doing. Yeah. I like it also very much. I have no idea how to do it. So he gives he gives away a little bit on the on the dust jacket here, um, but to get the whole picture, how everything here is connected, how one picture connects to the next how he's slowly moving from one picture, from, from picture to sort, from sort to back into picture. Um, this is really wonderful to, to look at and to read through. And um, it works It works both ways. It works, you're flipping through the book and see, ah, okay, how does it, how, how does it connect? How do we form this connection back to, how do we go back into the rabbit hole and arrive back at the initial picture here? And then you start reading some uh, something on this. Here you see he re is um, repeating the pictures in the text in a tiny form, and you see why this why this format works so good. Um, here the picture is too small; it's just a reminder to look at the at the actual picture in the book. And then here you can see that the the picture and the text are directly related here. So slowly you can piece his thought process uh, together, but you can also just enjoy how uh, the book is sequenced and how one thing is moving uh, from, a, from one to another, from these developed fingerprints um, back to um, fingerprints here all over this, uh, over this kitchen. Um, various persons taking off his fingerprints and if you take away this story uh you give the uh you give the pictures more room you give them room to breathe and you give the the pictures uh, the room to be whatever you think it may be so it's really an interesting way to to work in this way with pictures and text together and put the key in the middle um, just as a reminder, so this is a great book, highly recommended. Uh, just a reminder, this is the uh, the initial, um, uh, the, the first edition of this book, which has this, this inlet here, which is very costly to, uh, to produce. So I guess the second edition uh, is just uh, the text directly bound into this. So it cannot be flipped out 
So you cannot reproduce this um, this experiment by only looking at this or only looking at or only reading through this, but you only have uh, these things together. Uh, as far as I can remember, they've done this for um, just to drive the the costs for the book down because this makes it um, more much more expensive to do it this way. And this is already the end of our little journey today on text and image in photo books. Thank you, Stefan. Stefan, I have a question about Waffenruhe. Okay. About the text in Waffenruhe, uh, because I feel, you know, obviously the layout of text is also extremely important. And in that book, the text goes from left to right, and it feels just seeing it this way, extremely jarring to look at. And I think it must be hard to read. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't read the story. Do you feel that this layout for this specific story and this book makes sense? Or did you also find it difficult to read it this way? It is difficult to read. And that it is difficult to read uh, for me makes absolute sense because mm -hmm. it's um, the book is about the Berlin Wall about running into a wall. Uh, Anna Schleif, so this is the combination. Uh, Michael Schmidt uh, was in, in West Berlin. Uh, Anna Schleif uh, originated in uh, the GDR. So he comes from the GDR. So he had to um, to emigrate into, uh, into West Berlin. Um, so they have two different historical experience from both sides of the wall. So this that you flip through the images like this, 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 and then boom, you end up here. This is how the wall was. You just run into a wall and can't get past this. And you have to work through this text to get eventually with hard labor, get to the other side. Yeah, I feel like as soon as you mentioned the wall, it made complete sense without even reading it. <laughs> so that's really fascinating. Yeah. So it's, right. it's, it's a very deliberate choice here in the in the layout. And... Are there any questions from anybody before we sign off? Now is the time to ask. Let's see. I'm going to take off the spotlight so that I can see people. Okay, let's yeah, see. That, is, that is nice to see all of you. <laughs> Any questions at all? All right. Yes, I do. And yes, and uh, uh, Alan, you'll be second. Okay. I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm a little sick. I wanted to know who wrote uh, the text of the first two books. Uh, excuse my accent, but uh, Mutter Architecture and the first one, Ruffendru, as well as Paul Strand, the first three books. Um, you mean the, the authors of them? The, uh, yeah, I mean, for example, the um, Paul Strand book, is it a text by Paul Strand? Um, no, it's collected. Uh, it's collected material from uh, material collected by Nancy Newhall. So she was the editor, but it's uh, a lot of historical texts. So it's excerpts from uh, from ships' logs, for example. So it's a really a, a mix of of very different texts of uh, that uh, circulate around the New England area there. Um, so this is time in New England. This is mostly historic texts and uh, Florian Glaubitz here, the essays that you find in here. Um, I have no idea how he arrived at these three people that wrote these essays in here. Um, these are three different people and he just wrote them into the, uh, into the book here. So this is Nora Swantje Almes, Thomas Lindenberg and Maya. Marlene Lechner. I, unfortunately, I do not know the three of them. I also posted links to each book, not the Paul Strand, but all the other books. I put a link into the chat if you want to copy it from there. But it's again, so if you, if you, if you even if you look at this, uh, 
spread here. So this is this is very dry and this is very funny. So it's, this is what sums up my my feeling about this book. I really have very mixed feelings about this. <laughs> but please, Alan, good to see you. Good to see you. Oh, sorry, did, did, this is, did this answer your question, Anne? Oh, pardon me? Yes, did, thank oh. you so much. This is wonderful. Okay, thank you. So, All right, Anne, Alan, it's your turn. But okay, Stefan, good to see you again. And Anja, same. Um, what a lovely chat. <laughs> I really, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. you know, I've been thinking about adding text or dealing with text uh, in some form or fashion mm -hmm. down my road, down my journey of uh, what I do. Uh, adding it to, you know, another tool to, to communicate with. Uh, I like it a lot. I'm assuming that these books are still available or probably used, but nevertheless. So... Let me go quickly go through this. These are pretty um, new. So both Julia Palato and Florian Glaube, these are from this year or last year, I guess. So they should be still available. Uh, Waffenruhe has been uh, reprinted, so it's available. I have, I have Try to look up the um, the English translation of the text. Einer Schlief is unfortunately uh, not widely translated into English. Um, so I have, I assume there is an English translation, but I haven't found it yet. Okay. Um, but there is a brilliant essay by um, Alan Huck. I posted it into the chat also. And he is referring to uh, the text in here. So I assume there is an English version of it. Got you. Um, a handful of dust is available in a second edition, so should be available. So it should still be available. Okay. Uh, about this one, I don't actually don't know because I have uh, have it from an um, antiquariat, so from an antique bookstore. All right. There is also a question by Arsh. Can you? Uh... Yeah, you are next. Hi, Stefan. Uh, oh, yeah. So I had a qu question regarding the first book by Paul Strand. So after you go through it like a novel from start to finish, uh, do the pictures uh, after that, do the pictures uh, as you flip through them alone, do they have something else to offer? Like a normal maybe uh, photography series. You mean this time in New England, right? Y yes. I I'm a great fan of Paul Strand and the pictures are great. I think th this was a different time. So I, when you when you look at these pictures, uh, it's, it's sometimes hard to believe that it was that early because um, Paul Strand was really ahead of its time. Um, the, the pictures are not only illustrative. So they're not only illustrating the text. I think that the, uh, the pictures work by themselves, very good. As I said, the um, there are some some wonderful still lives here, which are really, and it's really beautifully printed. I don't know if this really gets through here in the in the reproduction here. So, Paul Strand just composes each picture very good. So, uh, it's apart from accompanying the text uh the pictures just work by themselves um and i just want to show you this this portrait this is just it's, it's just a good portrait and it makes together with the uh with the uh, with the text it really gives you a feeling for how how it was at that time when it took the pictures, how New England was at that time. So they are not not only illustrative, they are really good pictures. Sometimes they just work, okay, this is what you see. But every picture is just really good composed. So it's a yeah. For me the pictures work. Okay. okay. Anyone? Good. 
Stefan, once again, thank you so much. Always very inspiring, the books you put together for us. I really appreciate it. So um, and, being here. Thank and you. thanks, uh, exactly. Thanks for being here. So um, let's sign off and see you at the next photo book show, which is probably in about a month or six weeks, something like that. And maybe see you in one of Stefan's classes. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you.